In today's video, I'm going to be giving you a look ahead to RF4, the Rebreather Forum 4, which is happening in Malta in April. And I'm going to be talking to the godfather of technical diving and the founder of the Rebreather Forum series, Michael Menduno. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Divers Ready. My name's James. As always, so great to see all of your smiling faces. Now, you'll remember at the start of this year, I did promise you that there was going to be a lot more closed circuit rebreather related content coming to Divers Ready in 2023. And I keep my promises because in this video, we're looking ahead to Rebreather Forum 4. And there's no better person that I could call up and ask questions to than Mr. Michael Menduno, affectionately known as M2. Michael is the godfather of technical diving, and that's not hyperbole. He literally coined the term technical diving in his magazine Aquacore, the journal for technical diving, which ran from 1990 to 1996. So without Michael having done that, my company name would be Miami. People who like to go really deep, breathe funky gases, come up super slowly and make lots of stops diving. And that's just unnecessarily wordy. He is the foremost journalist in our sport and has written about diving and diving technology for more than 30 years, winning every award sport diving has to offer a media professional. Michael is currently the editor-in-chief of Global Underwater Explorer's in-depth online magazine, as well as an editor reporter for Dan Europe's Alert Diver magazine, a contributing editor for X-Ray Mag, and is a staff writer for deeperblue.com. He also produced the first tech conferences, Eurotech, USA Tech, Asia Tech, uh, and Rebreather Forums 1.0 and 2.0, and is a member of the Rebreather Training Council. So like I said, there's nobody better to speak to about that. Now, I have Michael on a Zoom call right now, and I'm going to get him to spill the beans on RF4. Michael, great to see you, buddy. How are you doing today? I'm doing good today, James. How are you? Good to see you. Very well. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. Well, <laughs> lately I've been really busy actually trying to get this rebreather form going. So, uh, but enjoying it at the same time. It's yeah, a lot of work. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so, I already give our viewership the key points as uh, the very, very lightest condensed version of your incredibly extensive bio in diving and dive journalism. Uh, but why don't you add to that your relationship, uh, personal relationship with CCRs and uh, the Rebreather Forum in particular? Well, I guess what would come first? The Rebreather Forum would come first because back in 1994, when we held the first one, you know, Mix was just coming into the market. Uh, it was very exciting times. And we all knew that we needed rebreathers. But you couldn't really get one, right? There were, there were a handful. Bill Stone had built his own, you know, the, the Cislunars. Uh, there were a number of uh, converted military units, the Mark 15-5s, uh, Stuart Cloth from the UK, Carmelin Research. Peter Reedy was kicking around with his first semicolon. So, but they weren't, they weren't available on the market. So we thought of, uh, my idea was to bring everyone together, uh, the tech community and the people who had rebreathers which were the military to come and talk about this and, and, and the manufacturers to talk like, well, how can we get rebreathers, right? So, so that kind of kicked it off. Uh, we did our second rebreather form two years later when Draeger, uh, we're all excited because Draeger came out with their uh, Dolphin, or Atlantis, a semi-closed nitrox rebreather. We're all excited because somebody big came out with a rebreather, though we were a little disappointed because it was for recreational liners. It's like, that's not us, you know? So. Um, so that kind of got the thing started. I ended up, well, whole long story of Aquacore and the tech conference, but I, I went out of business basically in the 1990s, uh, just before rebreathers started coming into the market. I think uh, Martin Parker had really the first, uh, pr you know, purpose built sport rebreather in 1997. And then Kiss came out right the year before. But I, I went out of business in 96. I, I went back into journalism world. So I really never got certified on a rebreather back then. It wasn't till all the way back into the 2000s 
I took a hiatus from diving for a few years and just worked on my journalism, but then uh, got back in the uh, the 2000s and uh, got certified on the inspiration. Uh, actually, my instructor, a guy named Paul Haynes from the UK, is an ex-British Special Forces guy turned tech diver. I think he's now back working for the military. But uh, anyway, so uh, I remember my opening class, he pushed the machine out and he said, Mike, this machine is going to try to kill you and your job and my job helping you is to not let it. Yeah. You know, and that's that's And I like that. I mean, I was like, yeah, great. Okay, let's do this. You know, so, so that got me started. Uh, been an inspiration diver for many years and then more recently in this last couple of this last year I actually uh, uh, got certified in the Liberty uh, the dive soft Liberty which uh, yes there there it is yeah which a great machine a great company and uh, you know I mean they're they're not the only great machine or great company but, but they're certainly one of them and uh, yeah so uh, glad to be back back in the loop as it were and, and we both share the same instructor on the on the Liberty as well, Mr. Joe Bosker. So shout out to Joe. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, shout uh, out for sure. He's. I'm, I'm sure really he said the team. same thing to you as well. He said, you know, back in the day, it was like this machine's going to try and kill you, and you're going to try and not let it. Now it's like, despite your best efforts, this machine will try and keep you alive. Keep you alive, right? Yes, right. It's a, it's definitely a shift of uh, mindset. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Fantastic. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about the upcoming Rebreather Forum 4 then. Um, right. Rebreather Forum 3 was 11 years ago in Orlando. Uh, and 11 years in CCR technology is a lifetime. So much changes, yeah. you know, new innovation all the time. What changes in the Rebreather universe can we expect to hear about at ooh, our ooh. Well, it's interesting. And really, the reason. I got this notion a couple of years ago, like, man, a lot has changed. We should go back and relook at everything. And I started mentioning this to people like Simon Mitchell and others. They're going, oh yeah, we need to do it. All two were from her. We need to do this. So um, that kind of got the momentum going. So just, I made a little lift. So sure. safety, 10 years ago, the issue, number one issue in the forum was everybody's dying on the rebreather. We're yeah, every month. What, you know, what, what the fuck? <laughs> I don't know if I can say that here, but you know, it was just, that was good. That was the issue, uh, safety. So that was huge checklists. I mean, just basic things that now I would say are pretty, you know, checklists. You expect people to do checklists. But back then it was, I mean, we had to have Jill Heinerth and Richie going, you guys need to do checklists. I do check, you know. So that was an issue. The whole uh, introduction of solid state sensors, they, you know, it looked like they were going to come into market then. They're still not quite in, and they're sort of there, but in the works. So there was that. Um, the issue of mouthpiece retaining straps, again, with lots of drownings, the question of air, airway protection. Of course, the military, you have a full face mask or, or you have a gag strap, a mouthpiece retaining strap. And now that's a new initiative. So that's something new. You know, back then there was the whole notion that we were going to have recreational rebreathers, right? Remember that? Yep. Uh, Poseidon, others, there were uh, some new semi-closed rebreathers, Kevin Gers, Explorer, others. And you know, it really never panned out. Recreational divers just never, I mean, all us techies thought, well, shit, of course they're going to go to rebreathers. Who wouldn't want to? But recreational divers just like, God, all that work, you have to clean the units, you got to prep them, you know, it's just, can't we just go diving? So it never really materialized. So so that's a trend. And then finally, I think we're seeing now because, well, we did a story about this in in-depth, looking at the dive depths, average depths of shipwrecks and caves back in the 1990s versus now. And we're a hundred meters. I mean, we've greatly, as you know, greatly expanded our reach with, you know, rebreathers, scooters, everything else, um, you know, so. We're seeing now the rise of dual rebreather, rebreather bailout. Um, this is not a new concept. Uh, Bill Stone on his original 1987 rebreather Fred, uh, uh, big 176 pound rebreather, it was a dual rebreather because he realized we need to bail out and why go to open circuit? So now that is coming into being with uh, groups like Kerr, Karst Underwater Research, uh, the Wet Mules in, Australia, in New Zealand, in Australia. So. So those are some of the trends. And, and I think there's also some a deeper understanding of some of the physio 
physiology issue, uh, physiological issues with oxygen toxicity and gas narcosis. So those are all the things we're going to be talking about uh, at this meeting. Fantastic. I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it and uh, looking forward to getting back to Malta as well. So yeah. on that topic then, the last or the first three Rebreather forums plus the Rebreather and Scientific Diving uh, workshop were all in the United States. So obviously the move to put the forum either in Europe or Asia uh, is applaudable and, and to, to make sure that we're, you know, uh, covering those markets and, and that kind of good mm -hmm. stuff. So that's fantastic. Malta has recently had quite a lot of controversy in the diving world. So my question to you is, do you have any regrets in choosing Malta over, say, Poland or Croatia, oh. given the recent sort of hostility that the Malta yeah. initial system has placed with the whole Arthur Castillo uh, lawsuit? And for those watching, if you're not familiar, I will link to that lawsuit, uh, a good article in the description of this video below. But it's pretty controversial. Good. Yeah, it is. I mean, the decision to go to Europe was, was obvious. We've had three in the US. We need to go somewhere else. So. Once I started talking to people there, everyone started pointing at Malta, like Malta, dive destination, we go diving and me. So that came up. This recent event, right, um, a court ruling uh, against a, a diver, uh, like you didn't save your buddy, you're, you're guilty, you know, um, in a very impossible situation. When I was over there in December, this was still in the works. I know many of the Maltese um, diving authorities are very upset by this. And it sounds like the ruling is going to be overturned. It was a lower court judge. Some of the circumstances around it, like the expert testifying, it was a hyperbaric doc, but not a diver. So his view of what you should do and what you should, you know, what, what a diver should and shouldn't do, uh, instance of care towards one dive buddy from a non-diver, you know, yeah. So I, I think it's going to be overturned. Uh, there, there's a lot of attention being paid by the Maltese authorities because I think like 10 or 15 percent of their whole economy is diving and 30 percent is tourism. So they they can't afford to, uh, you know, be punitive towards divers. And in this case, it, the, the circumstances of the case, just for any diver reading it, you go, what? How could, how, you know, how could they find this guy guilty, you know? Yeah, so. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I agree with everything you just said then. It's absolutely crazy what's going on there. And obviously the decision to put the forum in Malta happened before the, the law. Before, before that, yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. It's a, weird, it's a weird time to go to Malta with all these divers, and I'm sure it's going to come up at the forum and at the cocktail mm -hmm. party and, and that kind of stuff. So I was really interested to get your take on that. And I've been following that very, yeah. very closely. It's not, you know, things move slowly. We're only a couple of months out from the forest. So I don't know that it's going to be resolved or a higher court is going to hear the decision by then. I mean, I, I don't know. It may take a while. Yeah. No, for sure. So, yeah. Um, so who's going to be presenting at RF4? Who can we hear the wisdom of coming down uh, yeah. from the well, clouds of Olympus? <laughs> right, down right. to us, you know, and <laughs> sharing the wisdom and the science. Yeah, I, and, and I should preface it too by saying that one of the decisions we made was rather than have a meeting where people just presented on a single paper, like I just did a research paper on CO2 retention and here's the results. Each presentation, each topic area is meant to be kind of a synthesis of the knowledge in that area. Like what's the latest science with regards to you know, oxygen toxicity, what you know, what studies have been done? What's the latest thinking on it? Um, same, same with equipment and everything else. So these are synthesis talks, and we've actually uh, set up a chat room for our presenters to talk with other people who aren't presenting, who have new papers or research. So it really represents where we are as a community. And as I say, community, it's it's the broader rebreather community, right? It's not just tech divers, it's tech, scientific, and military, who obviously are large user groups. So so with that said, we have some really I mean, we have some really some of the top people really. Uh uh, where should we start? Some some nostalgia. Kevin Gurr, one of the pioneers of technical diving, uh, uh built three rebreathers, uh designed the Ouroboros, the Sentinel, the Explorer, which Hollis picked up. And now he's left the sport world and gone into the military world. So he's building a state-of-the-art 
a rebreather called the MCM 100 uh, for his Avon, a big defense contractor. So he'll be talking. Um, we actually have quite a few military people talking about military use. People like David Dulet from the Navy Experimental Diving Unit, one of the top diving decompression you know guys on the planet. He'll be talking. We have Richard Harris, Harry from the Wet Mules. Um, he is not going to be talking about Thai cave rescue, but um, him and his group, the Wet Mules, right now are in Pierce Resurgence, planning a really, really, really big dive. It, it will be a store, and so he is going to, you know, hopefully it will all go well, and he's going to come and be talking to us about this historical a dive. I should say that will be remembered a hundred years from now. So. Not, not inconsequential. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and just for the viewers' sakes, you know, you like you mentioned, Michael, for sure, you know, uh, Dr. Richard Harris from all of the Thai cave stories and the different ways that that amazing rescue has been told on film, in documentaries, in books, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you haven't checked out uh, Harry's YouTube channel himself, where he's, uh, you know, got a GoPro or Paralens running the, the footage for the dive and then doing a voiceover afterwards, and he's like, yeah, we had a buddy separation. We were 200 meters deep. And, you know, <laughs> I, I was right. getting kind of upset with my buddy. He's just so casual about the whole thing. And I'm just like. <laughs> right, right. Amazing. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. So I will link to that in the description of this video below. Oh, good, good, good. If you've seen that video, check it out. Alessandro Moroni, Dr. Moroni, the founder of Dan Europe, is presenting on his new diver, diver monitoring system. You know, we'll be wearing sensors which will talk to our computer which will be beamed up to the boat via ultrasound and people will be able to look and see what's happening with divers you might be able to adjust your decompression uh, they have software to look at yeah you should decompress a little more and send a signal back down to the diver so we're going to see that in real time actually we're going to um sandro's going to talk and we're going to have divers in the ocean live we'll have a feed to be able to see what's happening with divers so that's pretty exciting um uh, Andrew, Andrew Pitkin, uh, lead explorer, uh, lead push diver for uh, Karst Underwater Research. I mean, they're doing these, you know, two hour bottom times at 130 meters, followed by 14 hours of decompression, you know, pushing Wiki Wachi and, and, and some of the other line eater and some of the other springs. Um, Neil Pollack will be there um, talking about, who's going to be talking about uh, uh, the hazards of rebreathing, O2, toxicity, uh, CO2 problems like that. Uh, we have John Clark from the U.S. Navy, a retired scientific director, talking about his new book, Breakthrough. Uh, it's kind of 30 years of naval research on scrubbers. It's, it's called Revealing the Secrets. I have it here. It's, a, it's really a month read. Revealing the Secrets of Rebreather Scrubber Canisters. It, it should be a must read for, for every rebreather that is. Yeah. Oh, I you're looking I, for a, you have your copy? I think my copy's by my bedside, actually, in the house. Uh, the right. Right, because it's actually, it's I mean, actually it's, a geeky, it's a geeky read. There's math. But he does a great job, I think, of explaining what the math means and what it means for us as divers, you know? Yeah. So um, Phil Short, uh, people probably know Phil Short, another pioneer of technical diving. He's talking about the future of rebreathers and where the technology is going. Uh, we have people from, from, from Duke and Dan, uh, Franca Tillman is going to be reviewing all the safety. You know, we'd like to be able to say, and I think the feeling in the community is rebreather diving has gotten much safer. The, re the units are more reliable, etc. But we can't, it's just us saying it. I mean, there's no data. So, so that's important and she's going to address that. We actually also have sort of an historic cool thing happening um, that followed from rebreather form three. Uh, I got to give a shout out to Brian Carney on this. Um, you know, if you ask the question, how many rebreather divers have been trained in the last 10 years since rebreather form three? Reasonable question. Nobody knows. <laughs> you know, I mean, every agency keeps their own stats, but how many altogether? So we have an effort going on with the rebreather training council and, 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 and partly spearheaded by, by Brian to get all the agencies to give their last 10 years of rebreather certification data in buckets, you know, beginning, beginner, intermediate, advanced, uh, anonymize, uh, and anonymize them all. Uh, we have, uh, we're working with DEMA's research firm. So all the agencies will submit their certs. 
they'll scrub them all so you can't tell who's who. And magically, we, we'll have some good, hopefully some good data on, you know, what trends in the industry, how many people are trained, how many people are being trained, that sort of thing. So I, I think that'll help move us forward. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. always been so secretive, all those sort of student counts and cert counts and that kind of stuff. It's always been yeah. it's very hard to move on if you don't know where we are. Yeah. We we will have human fact if human the human diver is going to make an appearance, Mr. Garrett's lock. Can't have, a, can't have a conference without Garrett. You know, he's he's gonna come and talk. Uh, we have someone new this year, Rachel Lance from Duke University, uh brilliant scientist. She's She's looking at uh, real-time uh, mon diver monitoring uh, with sensors. You know, a lot of us are sport people, so we're used to monitoring our runs, our bikes, our swims, our sleep. So why shouldn't we be able to do that as divers, have really good monitoring systems? She was the one, she was very innovative, um, came up, you know, one of the big one of the big dangers in rebreather diving is hypoxia, right? You don't, you don't feel it coming on and boom, you're gone. Uh, unconscious so um rachel has done this work of putting looking at uh, you know we have spo2 sensors right just to see what our, our blood oxygen is so she's developed a system so that you could be a diver could be wearing basically a blood oxygen calculator a sensor and and she did a study that showed they, they actually had a several minute warning before they hit hypoxic levels so i see in the future we're going to have sensors to not only say your CO2 is high, but to say <laughs> your your blood your blood O2 is too low, uh, more oxygen, you know, to, to warn us ahead of time. So, I think a lot of exciting things are in the works. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that's worth the price of admission just there. Uh, never mind the fact that it's in Malta, which, as you said, is some of the best technical diving in uh, certainly the Mediterranean or Europe yep. at large. Um, so I'm I'm super stoked for all of that. Obviously, I'm going to go because, as the viewers of this channel know, I'm working my way towards rebreather instructor and mm -hmm. I'm in the biz. Um, but who else should attend? What's the target market? If people yeah. are watching this video and they're like, "Hey, should I go to this thing or not?" You know, I'm going to fly over or fly in for it. Is it worth it? Right. Who who should be in the attendees for RF four? So, this is a more at the the diving professional. So, instructors, vendors researchers you know scientific divers and, and, I, and i would say you know the high the high end ex, the explorers i mean people that are really engaged in this th those are the ones that should attend i think we're not you know if you just learn to dive a rebreather or you want to not not really for them this is kind of a high level meeting for for people who are already engaged or you know with with rebreathers so you know, we're, we don't have credential police or anything to turn people away. But but again, for, for the people that are working in this, that, that that's who the meeting's intended for, you know, so yeah. we can all move together as a community. Yeah, absolutely. And then that keeps the whole meeting concentrated and the information yeah. disseminates out from there. Yeah, that's awesome, Michael. Thanks so much. So if you fall into that target demographic of dive professional or CCR instructor or manufacturer or retailer, how can you actually attend? Ah, so if you go to the website, rebreatherforum.tech, .tech, uh, you'll be, there's an online registration system, a link to our hotel. Uh, our lead hotel is the Grand Hotel Excelsior. Uh, we have a special rate there that's lower than surroundings. So that's good. We'll have a reception there. So you can do all that on the, uh, on the website as well as book your diving. People want to go diving there. We have this opportunity through our partner Heritage Malta to dive these historic shipwrecks that the general public doesn't get to go on. So that's also on the website. There's a section on dive operations and you can book your diving so um, and, and the like. So and we'll do updates as, as we move forward and new things like the tri dives and other things that we're working on now to offer people will, will be available. So yeah. That's excellent. Michael, again, thank you ever so much for your time. Can't wait to see you in Malta in a, just a couple of months' time now. Thanks ever so much. I know. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thanks, James. Cheers. So if you are a serious CCR diver, a CCR instructor, a rebreather engineer, there is no better place to see or be seen 
than RF4 this coming April in Valletta, Malta. And I will, of course, link to the Rebreather Forums website in the description of this video below. And if you see me there, be sure to say hi. Thank you as always for joining me. I know this was kind of a long video, but it is what it is. Subscribe if you haven't done so already, and I will see you in next week's video, which I promise will be much, much shorter. <laughs> dive safe, dive often.